Recently, the Good 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 team and I officially launched issue two of the Good Newspaper. And this was a truly humbling and amazing experience for us because one, we're super new at this whole newspaper thing and it feels like we're finally getting the hang of things. It's definitely a humbling and vulnerable experience and it's it's a work in progress on the back end, but we're really proud of, of what we've brought. And number two, the stories inside of issue two are some of the most powerful stories of inspiring people bringing real change into the world. And every single page feels like an opportunity to spark real and messy hope into the world. And the world feels really, really dark right now in particular. And and we knew that this was important. We knew that it was important that we got this issue out with a sense of, of radical hope. And I mentioned the good newspaper because Our featured story in this issue is something really, really special. Issue two would not be what it is without the story of our new friend and today's podcast guest, Firuze Mamoudi. Now, Firuze and I met at World Domination Summit this year. It's it's a it's a conference in Portland that isn't as scary as it sounds. World Domination Summit. It's amazing. We both just happened to be speaking there, and the moment that I heard Firuze sound checking before the conference started i was hooked on her story she just shared a little snippet of her story but i i was drawn immediately to what she's doing because goodness gracious she's incredible her story really set sail during the 1979 iranian revolution viruze grew up in iran but moved back to the united states when she was just a preteen but growing up there and experiencing iran as a kid radically shaped who viruze is today Fast forward years later, and you see the Iranian people rising up again, this time in 2009. While witnessing massive rallies, captivated by excitement, chaos, and hope, Firuze decided to organize concurrent rallies in 110 cities worldwide in support of the Iranian protesters. She didn't know what she was doing. She had no experience in this sort of world before. But this ended up being the largest global day of support for Iran in history. And Nobel laureates showed up and it was broadcast on television. It was unreal. She is now the founder and director of United for Iran, an independent nonprofit based in San Francisco that works for civil liberties in Iran. You know, along those lines, Firuze says that the Islamic Republic coined her as an anti-revolutionary fugitive in one of their articles, which is I don't know very many people that have been deemed by the Islamic Republic an anti-revolutionary fugitive. So that's something that's happening on this podcast. Firuze is just amazing. She's got a lot of soul and passion for the protection and advocacy of human rights in our world. And I am so excited for you to get to know her. You may have seen her story in the good newspaper, but you're not going to want to miss hearing her tell her story. I am Brandon Harvey, and this is is Sounds Good. This is the weekly podcast where we have conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. And Firuze does just that. So let's jump straight into this. Oh my goodness. So you and I met in Portland just a few weeks ago. We were both speaking at World Domination Summit, which is like the best name for a conference put on by our friend Chris Gillibo. Uh, and I was so hooked by your story. And then I feel like we really connected over uh, just, you know, the course of a few days of hanging out in Portland. Yeah, it was an absolute pleasure to meet you in Portland. I can't believe I've been to 40 countries, but somehow it was my first time in Portland. I absolutely fell in love with Portland. Oh my goodness. Portland is so much fun. Did I make you eat Pips Donuts? I don't remember. I got some Pips Donuts at that final party. They're my favorite donuts in the whole world. I make most of my friends eat Pips Donuts, so I'm sorry if I didn't get a chance to like force you to eat them. Next year, promise? Yes, promise. Um, (laughs) Most of your story centers around Iran. Uh, And honestly, before I met you and before I heard your story, I didn't know all that much about Iran. Basically, I had, you know, seen a few movies where Iran was where, uh, you know, the center of the action was. I kind of paid attention to the the things going on in politics, especially over the last, you know, five to ten years. But 
honestly, I didn't have a huge grasp of things. And so your story really kind of enlightened me to the beautiful, hopeful story of what's happening in Iran, despite a lot of difficulties. And I've spent the weeks since we met diving deeper into trying to understand things. And so I'm excited to get to talk today about your story and what's going on in Iran and how uh, you are in a huge way having a ginormous impact alongside your team uh, in this country. And so thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. So much of your story centers around Iran. You grew up in Iran, right? Yeah. So I was born in San Francisco in 1971. And shortly after my sister's birth, uh, she's 17 months younger than me, my mom, my sister and I moved back to Iran. So I was a toddler and I don't remember the U.S. till I moved back when I was 12. So I lived in Iran for my some of my formative years, for 10 years till I was 12. And during that time, I lived through the uprising, the revolution, um, the new Because what year was this? The revolution happened in 1979. Wow. Okay. And what was life like for you then growing up in the midst of, I guess, you know, before the revolution actually occurred and then in the midst of it? What was that like? Life before revolution was fairly merry. Um, Iranians, I would say things are changing a bit in Turkey right now, but a bit like Turkey, fairly open. Um, people would party, and right now that may not seem like a big deal, but when in Iran that's illegal to do, it is a big deal. When one didn't have to cover, generally the middle class, not all of it, a, a good portion of the upper middle class and middle class were happy, as long as you were not pushing against the regime, threatening the regime, the government left you alone. And that was nice for many people. And the part that I didn't know about as a kid, uh, the dark side of it was that the lower class, the economically more poor, the more rural areas were not doing as well. And the Shah was not tending to their needs quite as much and was oppressing those that spoke out against them and torture them. So were you in that middle to upper class then? I was in, um, well, we weren't upper middle class. We were middle class and we were quite happy. Um, we had a, when my parents got separated and divorced, we moved into my mom's, mom's house, to my grandparents' house from my mom's side. And we had, my sister, my mom, and I had one room. And it was just perfectly fine. We were so happy. We had a, my mom had a fold-out bed. We had two nice beds and Life was really good. Then we got another house next to them, close to my grandparents. And I was happy, and um, life seemed full. And part of it was because of my family, my very loving family. As tensions were growing and as you know, things were getting closer and closer to the 1979 revolution, do you remember, were you a part of this at all? Was your family a part of this? Were you seeing this happen around you? Or did you kind of have a childhood where where you didn't really notice these things or partake in these things? What did that look like for you? I think a little, it was a bit hard to, especially as the revolution approached, you would have to be under a rock not to notice that the country was in upheaval. Um, it just was a matter of who was involved more in the beginning. So I definitely have a distinct memory of being in our family room and there were these old boxes of TVs that were had kind of uh, wooden veneer on them with legs. We had one of those TVs back then. And I remember Shah was on TV and he was apologizing and telling the people, okay, I'm going to do is, better. And who is Shah? Shah was the king of Iran at the time, the last king that we had. And a lot of people thought that was the beginning of the end. But at, at that time it was too late. And there were many things that led to that. So there was definitely this awakening. There was conversation everywhere. The same way uh, things have changed in this country since the last presidential election. And even people who were not political are now more political and talk about it because it's there, it affects everyone now. The same thing was happening in Iran and has happened for many decades, if not centuries. So people are politically much more aware and interested. Um, you can't go to a dinner party at someone's house where 
vast majority of the conversation is not about politics. So that was very much my upbringing. And then my mom joined a political party that was very much influenced by then USSR, which was a northern border of Iran. So there was a lot of communist influence. So it was a communist-leaning, left-leaning political party. And she, her friends and her were very active and and had a lot of discussions, a lot of meetings. Was that dangerous for her to be active at that time? It was some. She wasn't crazy active. You know, she wasn't, um, it was more a philosophy perhaps for her and her friends. Some of them were in prison, but not my mom. And it kind of shaped her views. And before the revolution, though, as these groups grew And all of them collectively, there were many different political factions, including some that were more religious and some that were secular. And all of them collectively worked together to change their regime, to have the revolution. And so that was all in the open, more or less. And once the revolution happened is when things changed, that over a few years' time, the Islamic Republic stole the revolution and essentially consolidated it consolidated power. Wow. Okay. And so you're in the midst of this. Today, I really do see you as a world changer and as somebody who's having a huge impact in amazing ways. Can you trace back any of that kind of revolutionary mindset uh, to you as an elementary schooler? Absolutely. And I think when I look at my colleagues, both in Uh, our organization, United for Iran, or our sister organization, ASL19, or many other ones, we all have our stories and all trace back in some ways to our childhood. Um, Those of us that are are Iranian descent, for sure. So for me, it was very much um, during my formative years, I had experiences that has, if you look at it, very much uh, led me to the path that I have taken over the years. So the revolution happened, like I mentioned, in 1979. And first of all, all schools and government institutions were shut down. So that's huge right there. You're in second grade and school's out. That's actually the best. Best case scenario, huh? That was the best. (laughs) Until then, the only time we would have school, the school would be out was on snow days. So on snowy days, we would be like glued to the radio in the morning to see what (laughs) county are they going to call up. So then here we are. And it's like this entire month of February and there's no school. So you're at home. Everyone's having conversations. And family members, it's very common from what I've seen, that this, in, in the same family, you would have individuals from completely different worldviews and political factions. So, for example, my grandfather would say, you guys are all for the revolution change because you haven't seen the Mullahs in actions. They're awful. You think you have it bad now. You have no idea what's coming your way. Go, go to your rallies. Good luck, you know. So I would hear that and hear my mom and all the dialogues and some of the family members, my uncle, who was not political at all and just was not interested. So... We saw that, and I was at home. And then the revolution happened. I was in the streets of Tehran, near the airport, when Khomeini, who was the first supreme leader of the revolution, um, flew in from Paris to Iran. And essentially, that was the end of the Shah's regime, who had fled, and he started the the revolution. He was the supreme leader. And so I very much remember that. And I also remember how things little by little changed for the worse and how promises were not kept and human rights violations and civil liberties were taken away little by little. For example, a couple of things that I remember clearly, um, one was that women didn't have to cover initially. They didn't have to cover their hair and their heads. Yeah, women didn't have to cover their hair initially. And little by little, that right was chipped away at so initially in government institutions and schools, uh, women and girls had to cover. And then at, on, in stores, all the storefronts would have a little sign saying, please come in with the uh, Islamic hijab or cover. And then you had to cover at all times or you would get arrested. Even little girls in Islam, you don't have to cover till age nine, but even preschoolers had to cover. And you only could wear dark brown, navy blue or black. So the country just became so dark. Uh, I remember that 
experience vividly personally. Yeah, when you went back to school, that means that you had to start wearing, that means that you had to start covering when you went to school then, huh? Yes, and the schools were no longer co-ed, so they separated boys from girls. So I only had female classmates, and they made everyone the other. And also, freedom of expression was taken away little by little. I remember a neighbor passing out some flyers, and she never came home. And they arrested her, and they kept her. We don't know for how long. And then when she came back, she was Kurdish descent. She went back to her family and we never saw her again. So that was, they kept her for at least a year. So those kind of activities became commonplace. And um, I remember one incident when my mom and her friends wanted, wanted to get rid of their books, their political books, and we filled the bathtub with water and put all the books in the bathtub and started shredding them so they would turn into this paper soup that was disintegrated and you no longer could read the words. And being less, being younger and less at risk of being harassed for it, I volunteered to put the papers in the garbage bags and be the one to take them out to the garbage chutes in our building. So those activities became part of our lives. My sister wasn't as political. Not every kid was like me, but some of us definitely were. And I cut my hair really short. So I was a total tomboy to begin with. I used to bet my friends how many stairs I could jump <laughs> in our big buildings. <laughs> and so um, I cut my hair super short and I hit puberty pretty late. So it was fairly easy for me to get away with, whenever I was not at school, with get away with pretending to be a boy and not having to cover. I would get funny looks like, is she, you know, but they're like, oh, whatever, you know, but it was almost passable. And I did that for a while. That's amazing. And so you said that you moved back to the United States at 12. What was the breaking point or the deciding factor on, hey, we're not going to stay here anymore? My sister and I, as I mentioned, were born in the U.S. And my dad moved to the U.S. in 1969 and has lived in San Francisco Bay Area since. So since we were born in the U.S., we had American passports. We were automatically citizens. So he came back to Iran with two crisp navy blue passports and essentially had a conversation with my mom and said that, look, the revolution has happened. This is no place to raise children. The war had just started a year or so before um, us leaving the country. There's a war going on. So I think it is best for me to take them to the U.S. I think they can have better lives there. And my mom was absolutely devastated. She had never remarried. We were her life. Um, and But she did think it was the best thing for us, and she let us go. And the story goes that for the first year after us leaving Iran, she had scabs on her cheeks because she cried so much. Um, so we moved to Burlingame, which is right outside of San Francisco Airport in 1983. Do you remember what the process of of even the trip to the airport being like? Because that's got to be a game changing experience to to know that you're leaving this country that you have known your entire life and that you're leaving your mother. You, what what was that like? Yeah, so it, it was complicated in multiple ways. A, I was you know a teenage young teenage girl, which has its own complications, and you're already kind of pulling away from parents. So I missed her, and I missed her being there for me more than I missed her at the time, if that makes sense. And I fully didn't believe that we were leaving for good. I'm, I kind of was saying, Mom, we'll, we'll just come back. We'll just go for the summer. That was kind of, I was telling myself that story. And I used to go back every few years to visit her till she was able to leave the country when I turned 22. And forever, airports for me are this very emotional sacred space. I actually gave a talk at the San Francisco No Ban, No Wall rally um, earlier this year, right after the first Muslim ban was put into place. And I talked about the airports. So when I go to airports, it's not seeing people who are really happy and tired and tan from their Hawaii trip or people going on a business trip and having a conference call at the airport. What I unconsciously scan for are people who are essentially 
their, their lives are being torn apart or coming back together. People who haven't seen each other for maybe decade and they're seeing each other and hugging because they love each other so much and life has not been kind and has not let them be together. And they're kind of scanning each other, just kind of pretending they haven't seen the other one age or people who are saying goodbye, not knowing if they're going to see each other again. So that's very much part of my airport subconscious. And so you moved to the United States. You're living in kind of the Berkeley area for a while. Fast forward a few years and you go to college. You go to UC Berkeley and you studied political economics. What was the thought process behind pursuing political economics? Oh, um, there was no thought process behind that. Essentially, <laughs> well, it was, uh, to be honest, it was junior year. They called me into the Office of Letters and Science and they said, look, you have to pick a major. You're a junior. And I'm like, darn, you know, and then so I looked at all the classes I had and that was the one major that I could get out of UC Berkeley the fastest with. So I moved to the U.S. when I was 12 and Burlingame, uh, junior high and high school were really hard years for me. I was away from my mom. I was hitting puberty. I didn't speak a word of English. I didn't really feel like I fit in. And I would, I guess, had math and running and I would just read at the library during lunchtime so people wouldn't know that I had no friends and sitting by myself. So it was hard times and it was very much in my shell. So when I came to UC Berkeley, I essentially lived what most people live in high school, started making friends and having hanging out and going for hikes and partying a little bit. So I was not so interested in school at the time. But by the time I got to graduate school, I was much more focused. And what was your focus when you went to graduate school? What were you kind of envisioning your future might look like? I went to a great program in Bloomington, Indiana, awesome college town at Indiana University at the School of Public and Environmental Affairs. And essentially, they have a dual master's program. You get two masters. I got one in Master of of public affairs and a master of science in environmental science. So I took all the different type of classes one needs in order to do environmental work from the policy side, the law side, engineering side, and so forth. And that's uh, what I graduated with. And for the first seven, eight years of my professional career, that's what I focused on. And yeah, what, what did that look like? Like when you, when you got out of school, What did you jump into doing? Well, I first convinced my college advisor to allow me to move to Amsterdam and intern at Friends of the Earth International instead of writing a master's thesis. My boyfriend at the time was like, how does that work? I'm here writing a 100-page paper and you're in Amsterdam? So I did that. Yeah, it's an amazing deal. Yeah, it was wonderful. And Netherlands is an incredible country and... So I lived there, I I, I did that, and I moved back to the Bay Area. I worked at a consulting firm for a while, and it was a river restoration consulting firm. It was a great place, but it was not the right match. So when I stopped working there, they let a bunch of us go on the same day. I kind of vowed to myself that I would make sure the next job would be the job that would be perfect match for me. So in order to make that possible, I went and worked night shift at a restaurant I used to work out work at when I was at UC Berkeley. So I would have the time and the resources to wait, wait it out, right? So usually we take a job because we, we have to pay rent. It's been two months. So this gave me time. It, gave me ten, it took me 10 months to find that right job. And I started working with a wonderful, powerful activist named Annie Leonard, who now is the executive director of Greenpeace. And I worked on environmental health and justice issues at a group called Healthcare Without Harm. And I focused on the, uh, in the global south. So a lot of work in India and the Philippines, some work in Africa and Latin America. Wow. And what do you think was prompting you to pursue all of these things that focus on making an impact in the world, that focus on fighting injustice? What was that passion coming from then? I think... Definitely had to do with my childhood. Uh, Seeing injustice was obviously a big part of my childhood. 
seeing people making change. Sometimes change is always, often, change is very messy and not a straight line, but people working at it when I was a kid and seeing how, wow, people got in the streets, they changed the government. We, people can do that. It is their government to change. So seeing that and seeing how the injustice has continued, all of that very much shaped who I am. And even as a kid, I remember reading a lot of lefty political books about kids who were poor and how they needed things they wouldn't get and kind of it was oftentimes juxtaposed with a rich kid who would get this fancy toy and didn't even want it and would throw it away or break it and that little poor kid was standing there every night looking at that toy at the toy store that there's other kids that I really don't want and um, those stories very much were formative stories in my life and I remember being Late elementary school, I went to my mom and said that I no longer wanted to go to school at the school I was at because that's where all the affluent kids went. I wanted, I wanted to go to a school where everyone was welcomed and I wanted to change schools to go to the school that's on the other side of our house in the then village. Now it's all built out. And my mom, to her credit, let me do that. So for a while, I went to this other school that I was the only one in our somewhat fancier building that went to. So I kind of had those values all along. And when I moved to the U.S. and during my early mid-20s, I kind of was in a frozen phase where I was a little bit off my path. And when I kind of got back on my path, it felt so good. And whenever I was of service to others, and still, that's that's when I feel most happy. I feel like I I'm so blessed to have so much in my life. I really am. And when I'm of service to others who don't have that or who are not in that position, um, it feels good to me. I don't feel that I'm doing that as a favor to anyone else. I feel that I very much believe that if I have a vision of the world, it's up to me to create it. It's up to all of us to create our own vision. And government's there for us. So we are there to shape it. And if it's not doing what we want it to, we need to be involved. And that activism is essentially same as breathing and paying taxes is one of the things or exercising part of it. something we have to do every day, every individual, every generation in order to make sure that our lives, collective lives is moving forward and progressing and not backsliding. And some of us happens to happen to be lucky enough to have more freedom. So we have to use that to exercise that right to the extent that we can. Wow. Okay. And so you're, you're doing this job that you're passionate about. You're doing this thing that matters. Fast forward and tell me about what happened in 2009 in Iran. So you might remember the uprising in Iran in 2009, the summer of 2009. The presidential election took place, and right before the election, there were a couple of new candidates who were reformists, and Iranians were really excited, and they were in the streets. Um, it was called kind of the Green Movement. Uh, that was a color of one of the presidential candidates. And the election happened, and it was very quickly called for the conservative incumbent, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And people questioned that, the, and went into the streets and questioned it, and they were met with a lot of violence. And that grew and grew to the point that we saw the biggest uprising in Iran since the 1979 revolution. And the government was rightfully so worried for its very existence. And the backlash became really big and violent and people were killed and slaughtered in the streets. And the world was watching. It was everywhere. It was all over CNN. In fact, we kind of joked that this is what all that was covered until Michael Jackson died, literally. And then CNN changes soon and started talking about Well, and I remember on on social media at the time, this is as Twitter was really gaining its legs. It was starting to just blow up. And and I could be there following along with the revolution on the street. You know, I was seeing these protests from the perspective of Iranians. Yeah, it was called the, I mean, some people called it the Twitter revolution. Others felt that it was overstated. But um, Iran election was trending for sure. Yeah, that was the hashtag. And people were doing whatever they could to get the news out. So they would make these videos on their phones and they would get arrested for it too. And then they would tweet and post it on YouTube. And I think the most watched video was 
a video of a young woman named Neda who was killed in daylight. She was just attending a protest, just kind of got out of her car to see what was going on, perhaps even. And she was shot and she died looking at the camera. So you saw, you saw her getting shot. And then as she's looking at the camera, the life leaves her body. And it was the most watched death of its kind ever in history at the time. I think it still might be. So that, and then the government was not happy about that. They actually spent tons of money making documentaries talking about how this was not them and, you know, the, it was, they were framed and all kinds of crazy stories. So when the uprising happened, I was heartbroken and so was literally any Iranian diaspora member you talked to had, had, had a similar story. They were heartbroken. They were also relieved that for the first time there was a distinction between the people of Iran and the government of Iran in a big way around the world. So, so people would see these kids, you know, with their gap shorts hanging out of their Levi pants, and, and they look like everybody else's kids. They, you know, and people saw that, oh, they're just like us. So that was very clear, and we were relieved about that. And so inspired. There was one day that 4 million Iranians, 3 to 4 million Iranians throughout the country protested in complete silence. They just walked, not a word. And to this day, I, I'm right now, I, I got chills <laughs> thinking about it. It's, it was such a powerful day. And, and it was heartbreaking to think that all Iranians want, and this is my, I believe this is the most universal human experience. All people want is to be left alone, to live their lives to their fullest potential, to be happy, and for their kids to be happy and have good lives. That's simple, right? And it was taken away from them. It was just pulled away from them. It was like a bad trip. I could not, like, I guess it was such a bad nightmare to see. So I decided, um, one thing I knew how to do was organize, being an activist, that I would organize a global day of action. So I went to my husband, Andre, who's so sweet and is wonderful and puts up with me, which for, for which you should get a gold medal. Um, so I'm like, so Andre, I have an idea. And he's like, okay, let me sit down. What is it that woman? And I said that, I want to organize a global day of solidarity around the world with the people of Iran. What do you think? And you've never done anything like this before, huh? Not for Iran, no. I mean, I've I've been part of activists and organizing and rallies, but nothing like this, no. And I'd never worked on Iran This is like next level. Yeah. You know, I think for me, I definitely am one of these people like, okay, if it's a good, I'll just do it. I'll figure it out, you know. Just figure it out, whatever it is. I think... Moving to a new country and starting over a bit on my own, you learn to be resourceful so and resilient. I think those are kind of the, the shiny sides of the hardship I felt through my teenage years. So he said, that's it. That's all you're going to do? Just a global day around the world? That's it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like, okay, you do it. And then we were supposed to go on uh, our summer vacation to a friend of mine, to a house of my friend in New Jersey on the beach. And I send him off although he had never met her, and uh, with the, our, my, my step-boys, um, who were then, I think, maybe nine or ten. And um, my little guy stayed home with me, and they left, and I had three weeks to organize. And I literally Googled Iran human rights to figure out uh, who to call. And, and anyway, three weeks later, fast forward three weeks, we had events in 110 cities. There were organizers, like, Dozens of people organizing in each city. YouTube's band manager called me to ask for pictures to project on the walls during the song, Sunday Bloody Sunday that day. I, I was so mad, crazy, busy that I, when the phone rang, my friend was picking it up. My house was kind of like the campaign center for the Bay Area. So you have to take this. I'm like, I'm busy. He's like, you don't understand. You have to take this phone call. I'm like, okay. So we had eight Nobel Peace laureates um, lend their voice, and many of them attended one of their events or made a video for us. Um, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu and our own Nobel Peace Laureate. And um, Amnesty was involved. Many different groups were involved. Reporters Without Borders, Human Rights Watch. So after that, which became the biggest day of solidarity for the people of Iran in history, and it still is, I transitioned from my job. I was doing environmental work, but kind of still at the NGO, but kind of officially working for the UN, which is its own other story. Uh, so I transitioned from that job and started United for Iran. Wow. Okay. And so 
you go from basically being somebody who's working for a nonprofit, you are a mother, and you are living all the way across the world from this thing that you're experiencing, and then all of a sudden you unite countries around the world. You bring you 2 in on the project, you bring Desmond Tutu in on the project, and you get people talking about what's happening. And people show up, and what would you say was the impact of creating this big event? What was the impact of organizing this global day of action for Iran? So I think um, we've been in touch with individuals who are imprisoned in Iran and other, and we know this through the work of many other wonderful human rights groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty. There's a reason Amnesty has a candle uh, for its logo and Shine a Light is their logo or Bear Witness is tagline for Human Rights Watch. Being there and witnessing um, does so many things. One, people, it's really hard being in prison. I haven't personally experienced it, really. Um, but my colleagues have, more than half of my colleagues were in the streets of Iran in 2009 and have been in prison, harassed and tortured. And you lose hope. Yeah. And having people remember who you are and makes us feel like it's worth it. I'm doing something, people value it, I'm not alone, and they can continue. Especially if you're being tortured, be it physical or psychological. In Iran, psychological torture is very prevalent, uh, also called white torture, oftentimes in form of solitary confinement in other forms. So that's one piece. And though many times governments pretend they do not care, they do, especially the government of Iran, I can speak for uh, for a fact that they, whenever they have a political prisoner, they really pressure them not to speak and have their family members not speak with the media, saying your case will get worse. And almost always, there are always, of course, few exceptions, almost always, whenever the case is of someone who's more prominent or the media is covering it or there's a big campaign, they are either released earlier or treated better while they are in prison. So th- those were some of the effects. Um, some of it was um, also it's what led to the creation of United for Iran. I don't think with that, that day it would have started. So this day happens, and soon after you leave your job and you begin a specific organization to essentially continue these efforts, United for Iran, what happens next? What's the next big thing that you decide to accomplish now that you've done this thing that is ridiculously big, uh, seemingly impossible. What's the next big thing that you decide to tackle? We started United for Iran, and I was new to human rights work. I'd done environmental health and justice work, which, of course, has human rights components to it, but not direct human rights work. I'd never worked on Iran. I'd never, I had started projects, but I'd never started an entire nonprofit on my own. And I had never been executive director. So everything was new, and we had a sharp learning curve for the first few years. I was trying to figure out what would work, what wouldn't, what campaigns or strategies would be the most effective ones. And initially, we had very little contact with those inside the country, So, I, which makes it really hard to know what to do that's correct and the right thing and strategic and also collaborate with those who are mostly uh, to support those that are inside. Because ideally you want to create space for those inside Iran to continue the activism. So we did what we could, but it took us a little while to figure out the best ways to have traction, which was fine. And um, I also have a lot of energy and stamina and and persistence. So even if things are going hard, I'll just keep at it. So for the first few years, I mean, not to say we didn't do things that were important and effective, but they were perhaps not the most effective things we've done. It took us a little while. So for the first few years, um, the movement inside Iran continued, right? It took a while for them to completely quash out the movement. For the first few years, we provided support to the movement that was still taking place in the streets of Iran. We were advocating for the political prisoners and for the activists, civil liberty leaders inside the country. And we ran amnesty-style campaigns, a lot of online petitions and postcards, including, I think up till now we've sent about 600,000 petitions and postcards. We had 
other global days. At the six months anniversary of the uprising, we had a arts day. So we worked with a lot of artists and musicians around the world and had 33 events, concerts or art galleries in 30 cities on International Human Rights Day in December of 2009. At the one year anniversary of the uprising, we had another global day with events in 88, 87 cities, and there was one virtual reality event as well. And each of them adopted at least one, up to two or three political prisoners and advocated for them. Um, one event was in South Africa, I remember, where we raised funds and worked with a local team to rent buses as well as a, get a big newspaper ad on the first day of the World Cup which was the exact day that we were having our events. So, and then we had mobile billboards in London and LA. So that was that day. So for the first few years, that's what we did. And then things changed a little bit. We wanted to become more systematic and less reactive. So oftentimes in this line of work, one is responding to what's happening. And if you want to make deep, lasting change in any kind of organizing and campaigning, really, you want to be systematic and think long-term and not always be on the defensive. And that's really critical. So we kind of thought about that and being systematic. And also the movement inside Iran was almost non-existent, really. It was, some people use the analogy of embers under ash at this point. So it's still there, but because of all the persecutions, no one's doing anything. There's still, we saw that in 2009, when the moment was right, 4 million people poured into the streets. But when the moment's not right, people go home. So, so we saw that, and the government had people imprisoned or um, have the, had them in silos in their own homes with the deed of their parents' house being held over their head or lashes if they were active. And many people left the country. So keeping that in mind as well, that many people left the country, we kind of that shifted all of our work. First, we, we, I reached out to a lot of individuals who were the leaders inside the country who had left and invited them to join our group. Um, some of them joined in as while there were refugees in Turkey. Um, my co-director, Reza, was one of them. And our lead researcher, Mehdi, for the, our database of political prisoners, another one. And some of them moved to the Bay Area, which is not that rare. Uh, it's rare for folks to move to the Bay Area who are active in Iran, because it's literally 11 and a half or 12 and a half hours time differences across the planet. So I would definitely reach out to anyone here and have them get to know us and hopefully join us if it makes sense. So for the next few years, we built our team um, and we started what we call now the Iran Prison Atlas. And Stephen Inskeep of NPR just did a great piece talking to our lead researcher about it. Essentially, it's a database of all the political prisoners in Iran and the prisons they are held in and the judges that sentence them. And it's very interactive. One can see a profile of one prisoner, click on his or her prison, and then zoom out and see who else is in that prison or what type of mistreatments happen, or look at her judge or his judge and see what kind of violations this person's responsible, or rank the judges against each other on lashes, total number of years sentence, number of execution sentence, and other factors, and compare the various groups and how they're being treated. Are the Baha'is being persecuted more than the other religious groups in Iran, for example? So that's become the core part of our human rights work, and it's more systematic and leads to transparency and accountability in Iran. And, and that's huge. The transparency is huge, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, I think with any line of human rights work, documentation, transparency is always critical. If, you, if the information doesn't exist, they often deny it if it's not documented. So it's a very much the first step. And perhaps the supreme leader and the top layer of the political party, they may already feel that there's nothing they can do to change their fate if something changes in the country. But a prison warden would be more cautious if they if he if he knew that he's being watched and his mistreatments at that prison or uh, under his watch are being examined and documented and the family members of the political prisoners look at this and are in touch with us and different government agencies and the UN document and use it quite as well so that's a big portion of our work that's what we did 
um, doing our third and fourth year started it, and we're still continuing and building on it. And a few years ago, we decided to expand even further. Um, again, wanting to be more proactive and creative and have fun. And this line of work is really hard work. I sometimes worry about my colleague Mehdi, our lead researcher, because all he reads about all day is torture and executions and political prisoners. It takes a toll on one's soul. And doing that important work, but building on that to include work that's creative and fun and youthful and full of energy, I think is really critical as well. So a few years ago, we launched what we call the Iran Incubator. It's an Iran-focused incubator. It's such a good name. Thank you. Reza had the brilliant idea. I came up with the name. And so through this incubator, we are supporting our community in building technologies to be used in Iran. And they are, there's a wide range of them. One of them focuses on victims of domestic violence, providing information to them on therapists as well as healthcare officials, as well as um, there's a survey so you can take it and know if you're in an abusive relationship. Often women think that that's how men act and that's not necessarily abuse. So kind of educating them on that and providing a lot of content of if they want to get divorced, here's a a PDF to download and use this information. What I love about this app is that if I remember correctly, a lot of this stuff is kind of sneakily included in the app so that you kind of have to go a layer deeper and then you find all of this other stuff uh, that, you know, empowers women in Iran uh, because there's a lot of censoring that happens within the app store and technology and the Internet. So the app you're talking about, I think, is the one that I spoke about at the World Domination Summit. It's a slightly different app. It's a app that's about it's a period tracker it's the only menstruation calendar in persian and it has information about stis and contraceptives which is used but the part of that app that's used the most is a section that provides language to women that they can include in their marriage license to ensure equality so if they include a certain sample sentence for example they can ensure that they can still leave the country once they're married without the permission of their husband or continue work or even have custody of their children. So this language is included in the app. And if that's not included in the marriage license by default, the man has all, all the rights. But if it's included, essentially the, the man's giving up his extra rights. It's what's the way it works. So that, that's been a very popular app, um, probably more, our most popular app. It's been, in the last four months, maybe downloaded... 130,000 times and viewed 2.3 million times inside Iran. So it's been really exciting for us. So going back to your question around what next thing we did that was really exciting, um, once we built the apps, our um, databases, the Iran Prison Atlas is critical and such important work. But this is a work that's showing a lot of traction inside the country. So it's really exciting. And the app has been viewed 2.3 million times, and I think total amount of time on the app has been over 20,000 hours. And so it's really exciting. And other apps focus on recovering drug addicts, ones similar to SoundCloud, but in Persian for the Iranian context where people can download various content at home and listen on the go because data, phone data is expensive. And a lot of the content that's being shared is blo- the websites are blocked and no one's listening to shortwave radio. So it allows people in one convenient location to get all this content for BBC Persian or Radio Free Liberty. And individuals can have their own channels as well. You could, for example, if you spoke Persian, have a channel and have people subscribe to it on that uh, app. And I have other ones coming out too. So this has been really exciting. And I think... The reason it's doing well is because Iranians are ready for change. And every time they get a chance to vote for someone who's more global and liberal, they do it. And they're very globally minded. They're super educated. And 70% of those studying science and technology at universities are women. There are about 3 million Iranian women over the age of 30 who have chosen not to get married The government has this veneer of conservatism, right? But under it is this vibrant, educated population. And they're super techie as well. 
I would say, 45 million smartphones in Iran population of 80 million. So people are really connected as well. And I love that you're creating all these tools to continually empower the Iranian people. Do you feel like we're on the verge of something? Like, what are you hopeful about in the next few years of Iran? So um, it's so hard to know, you know, hindsight's 2020 with future of countries. I definitely will. I'm right now blacklist and I can't go back to Iran. I do hope that in my lifetime, I can go back. I have no idea how quickly things will change. And what we're doing essentially is creating space for Iranians to engage civically and use their civic engagement muscle in a big way and in areas that's important to them. So one reason this area of work is doing well is because we have chosen topics that is important to the people of Iran. It's, it's benefits them very directly and they're not super sensitive. So the government is allowing this work to happen and people don't feel the repercussions of, of their activism or their engagement. So they're allowed to do this work. So we, we are supporting that space, which is so important. And I think with any technology work, it's really critical to build tools with and not for communities. You never want to drop in a tool and say, hey, do you like this thing I made? Do you want to use it? You really want to work with the community and see what they need. And if it has a tech tool that could go with it, that would make sense to have as part of the overall movement to engage more people or get information out or have them connect with each other more or whatever other purpose you have. And then if there is, support them in building and maintaining that tool. So they are really the owners. And that's a model we use and very much believe in. And I think our success is because of that. So we have reached out and had a contest and individuals or groups submitted their ideas and we took the best ones and worked with them. And only this week, I think yesterday, we launched an app called Mishka. It's an ebook video game that's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. And this young Iranian woman who was sexually molested as a child in Iran has built this. And it's essentially for children and parents to be able to talk about sexual abuse inside Iran, which is such a taboo topic. Everyone avoids it. And the kids avoid it. And of course, that's understandable. And the parents pretend it's not there because it's so difficult and painful to think about even. So the app focuses on that. So that's there's just wide range of topics that people are interested in that we're supporting. That's absolutely incredible. And you guys have found a great deal of success with all of these apps. They've been, like you said earlier, they've been downloaded by so many people. So many people are uh, taking notice of this who need this, but also the government has taken notice of, of especially you and what you have been up to. Um, they gave you a, a title. What did they say about you again? This was a few years ago. This was in, um, I think, June 2013. They called me an anti-revolutionary fugitive. So I thought that was a pretty badass title. So I put it in my business <laughs> card. That's so amazing. I love that. But unfortunately, there are repercussions that come with that. You mentioned this already, but you are no longer able to go back to Iran and you still have family there. Tell me about this this choice, because I know that it was a, an intentional choice to say, hey, I know that there will be repercussions for my actions. I know that there will be repercussions for stepping in and, and playing a role in people's lives in Iran, contrary to what the government wants. But I'm going to do it anyway, because I know that that can't have been easy. It wasn't easy. And it was during the uprising when I organized a global day of action. And I thought about it and I felt like it was, it was so important. People were giving up literally their lives, years of their lives, years away from their children. And this is what I could do. And what I was giving up was so much less. It doesn't make it any easier and it doesn't get easier with time either because you miss people more over time and you want to go back and you still can't go back. And it's hard. And the parts that I didn't think about, one, I didn't fully think that my kid could not go back either. You know, his dad's American and I'm, I'm blacklisted. He can't go back. And that's heartbreaking for me because I really want him to have a full sense of his Iranian side. You know, he speaks the language and went to this incredible language immersion cultural center in Berkeley called Golestan. 
And so he was, has that community for sure. But he went to Iran when he was a year old and two years old, and now he's 10 and he can't go back. So this year, maybe for Persian New Year, we will go to Tajikistan because they celebrate so that he can have that. But those are the kind of things I have to do. And it's hard. And I can't see my dear family. Many of them can't leave the country. Coming to the U.S., especially now, it's really difficult. And Iranians rightfully are cautious about their safety and security. And part of that is self-censor. Iranians, and that's why the government is able to succeed. They instill so much fear in their in their citizens that they self-censor. So my, some of my family members don't want to come to Turkey, uh, I have offered, like, why don't we go and I'll rent a house in Turkey on the beach and we'll hang out for a few weeks. And they're too worried to do that. And of course, I respect and understand that. And I think the hardest part has been that um, I've had multiple family members on their deathbed and I have not been able to go back and see them and say goodbye. And it's hard. It's really hard. I'm so sorry. Thank you. And it's still worth it. And if I had to make a decision again, I still would do it. I feel that we're doing important work and it's just extra motivation to make sure we're doing enough work to make it worthwhile and working well enough that we can go back soon enough. Yeah. Do you think that in your lifetime, you're going to have the opportunity to go back to Iran, maybe in, you know, a, a more free and more progressive Iran? You know, Brandon, I'm not sure. I hope so. But it's, politics is such a complicated thing and it's so hard to know. It might happen so quickly, right? And then it may not happen. I know that it will happen eventually, even if it's not in my lifetime, though it likely will happen in my lifetime, that it's just a matter of time. When you have a population that's super young, 70% of the country is like under the age of 35 and is progressive. Maybe the government and their cronies and family members and are 10% of the country, 50 max. So there's 85, 90% of the country that doesn't want this. So, and the government has their back to the wall in a way that in order to stay in power, they have to do these things and be oppressive. But things are opening up a bit as well. I see that too. So it's hard to know, but I do think it's just a matter of time. So you're a fugitive, you're an activist, you're doing all of these things. And this is important. This is powerful. We've shown that like through this podcast, we've seen that people like you who are stepping out through all the risk, through all the pain, through all the difficulty and deciding to make people's lives a better place to create sustainable actions that have an impact on the future, like the world becomes a better place. And I know that you want to instill that on your son. Tell me about the ways that you've already started to do that. You know, I think you said he's he's 10. Um, and what are the plans for the future? Because I know you've got some cool stuff in the works. I do have plans for the future. Um, so I am leaving in a very short time, in fact. So I have another week and a half here in Berkeley. Then I'm going to Burning Man. Then I'm going to come home. <laughs> I love how pack. obsessed with Burning Man you are. Oh, no. Am I? Do I seem like overly obsessed with Burning Man? Oh, no. <laughs> I do love it, though. Um, so And then I'm coming back. And then I am going to work on my computer around the world with my son and husband, we're going to travel for a year and do community service wherever we go. I'll homeschool my son. And homeschooling takes a lot less time for the kid anyway. So maybe three, three and a half hours a day, five days a week is what will be required to do schoolwork. And then the rest of the day, we'll just travel and also do extensive community service wherever we go. And part of that is to instill this values in my son. I don't think one can talk about what's important and how privileged we are. I think one has to live it and experience it themselves. And also, I think the hardest part of parenting is there's no shortcuts. You just have to model and be the person that you want your child to be. There's, that's it. So I think hopefully by, by seeing the rest of the world, experiencing other places, doing community service, and just making friends that are different than who he is right now, um, I will hopefully inspire him to be his best self and to give back and to realize how blessed and lucky he is and how both huge and incredible and small the world is. We're starting with Greece. 
we're going to work um, at a, a refugee center for the next few months. That's beautiful and that's powerful. And I am so excited to get to follow along and I wish I could just come along for the adventure, but I know that this is going to be a really important experience for your son and for you and your husband. And uh, ultimately, I'm hopeful that because of your son's experience around the world like this, you know, the world might be a better place because of the things that he does as well. I hope so too. And I think a huge part of activism is educating our children on what the world is like, especially in this somewhat dark times. It's really important, I think. And so much of its values, it's value driven. And if you want to follow, kaz.world is the website. <laughs> Perfect, kaz.world. And if you want to know more about our work, uh, please sign up for our newsletters, United for Iran, the number four, United number four Iran.org. I'm leaving this conversation so inspired by the way that you just put yourself out there and, and kind of in a scrappy way, you decided to just say, hey, how can we make a difference with our skills and talents and abilities in the place that we're at? And you ultimately succeeded in that and you're continuing to succeed in that and your team, you guys are all just continuing to move forward for people who, you know, they want to start a revolution in the way that you have and they want to create solutions you know, what's a great first step for so many people? What's something that people can go out and take action on tomorrow in their own lives? That's a good question. Um, I think it always starts at home in so many ways. So how we show up in the world, I think, is really critical. I think sometimes uh, I am humbled by my mom making a comment that, yeah, you're a great activist, but you just had a really mean tone with me, you know? So, um, and it's, he, she says it usually in a snarky, funny way. And she's right. So I think how we show up is really critical, how we are with our families and friends and community and our children and how we inspire them and support them and being their best selves, I think is important. And I think we all have passions that are very personal and real to us and it varies from person to person it might be something that happened to us during our formative years that has shaped it or other experiences or our natural interests and instincts so listening to those and building on those and seeing being clear about the vision of the world that we have and knowing that the only way to create that is by being involved in engaging in that and and moving forward with that i think that would be a good first start I think that is absolutely beautiful. What a wonderful way to wrap up this episode. Thank you so much, Firuze. It really means a lot that you took the time to have this conversation, and, and I'm so thankful for the work that you're doing. And I'm so grateful that we met in Portland and for you to invite me to come on. It's been an absolute pleasure, and you're so big-hearted. I so appreciate what you do. Don't you just love Fibrose? Don't you want to just live with as much passion and conviction every day like she does? I know that I do. I can't stop thinking to myself how lucky her son is to be growing up under such a powerhouse like his mom. She's doing incredible things in the world that are unmistakably good and incredibly important. I mean, do you get why we decided to feature her story in the good newspaper? Her convictions marked by heart and soul are making real change in the world. Real change in the world. It's really fascinating to me how we think that sometimes the things that folks like Firuze are doing could never be done by us, that we could never do something as radical and important, but we can. Remember, Firuze said that activism is essentially the same as breathing. I think she really meant that. Every individual, every generation has to do this every single day to make sure that we are all progressing. I think it's really important to note that some of us happen to have more freedoms than others, and it's, it's our duty to make sure that we exercise that for the good of others. Everything Firuze stands for is what we're passionate about here at Good Good Good. If you connected with this episode, make sure to find Firuze on social media, on Instagram or Twitter. Let me tell you, we recorded this a few weeks back, and uh, I actually just got to catch up again with Firuze uh, a few days ago. We, we caught up on Skype. She's in 
Get this, she's in Greece right now. She and her son are supporting Syrian refugees in Greece. And it's really, really beautiful to see. And uh, she was asking me for some advice on how to share these stories on social media. And so, uh, you know, I say go follow her on Instagram and uh, maybe it'll be like a little bit of a kick in the butt. <laughs> I don't know if I can say that, uh, but for her to share some more of these incredible stories of her and her son's adventures and You know, you can follow her and just see what she's up to. I highly recommend it. Uh, You can also follow United for Iran and uh, visit unitedforiran.org. That's the number four. Seriously, I love the work that they're doing. And uh, and if you can support it financially, absolutely do that. Please do that. I'm so inspired by the incredible and innovative, impactful things that they're doing. If you're new to Sounds Good, we would absolutely love for you to stick around. You know, don't let this be the last episode of Sounds Good that you'll listen to. You might also love our conversation with journalist and storyteller Noor Tagori or our episode with the co-founder of Invisible Children, Jason Russell, who is also about to embark on a world trip with his kids, teaching them about activism. So I actually introduced Jason and Firuze, and hopefully they're going to bump into each other and cross paths. But uh, you can hear about his adventure on his episode as well. You can find all of our conversations with inspiring people on Apple Podcasts, as always. But also, we're super excited that we are now on Spotify You can totally listen there and you can share your favorite episodes with your friends, just like you do with your favorite music. It's so much fun. This podcast is created by me, Brandon Harvey, as a part of Good, 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 a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news. Thank you so much to Chad Michael Snavely and the whole team at CM Studio for editing and mixing this show. You make this show awesome and I would literally be dead without you. If you love the good news stories that we're sharing on this podcast, the stories of people creating a hope in the midst of darkness, you can get lots more hopeful stories on social media by following us everywhere at Good 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 Co. I think my favorite of our accounts is probably our Instagram right now. I don't know. It's really, really fun. But Twitter's good. Okay, I can't decide. Anyway, as I mentioned before, we also create a beautiful quarterly newspaper This celebrates the people, ideas, and movements that are shaping the world for the better. V. Rousse is our centerpiece story in this issue. Uh, And goodness gracious, is that a good article? I did not write it, so I'm allowed to say that. It's a really fun piece, and uh, I really hope you enjoy it. You can order the newspaper, learn more about why we... (laughs) why in the world we created a newspaper, and see what else we do at goodgoodgood.co. And on that note, that is officially a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and do some good this week, and we'll be back next week with another inspiring story from an incredible person. Sound good? Sound good?